We say 6 o'clock with the uh, Persian delay factor, PDF, because 6.30. But that's part of the plan. It's okay. That's part of the plan. Okay. Welcome to NEPOC. A uh, little bit background about NEPOC. We've been established in the 80s, more than 30 years of uh, existence. We are a non-profitable 501C and C3. And uh, basically, Christian, next one. Basically, let me summarize. This is what we do. Uh, the number one pink circle business mixers. Part of our second Thursday of every month, we are here for business mixer. This is kind of after the meeting, you can mix for business or before it. Cultural events, we have uh, quite a few cultural events, no rules. Uh, we used to have Merigans, hopefully this year we're going to have Yalda. Uh, educational classes, depending on what is needed. Uh, for instance, we had QuickBooks uh, the month before, something that a lot of people needed. Supporting the arts whenever possible. That's uh, not, you see the circle is not that big. We are not Farhang Foundation, but <laughs> we try to do our best. Then internships whenever we can. Uh, we've been doing that on and off, and it's been little but successful. Career counseling, uh, we've been doing that for the last 30 years. Uh, we review resumes, uh, help out with forwarding it. Sometimes interview techniques, we do it as individual, one-on-one, one -on -one, and sometimes we have the classes about it. And the business directory that we have on our website. So that's what we have, basically, in a nutshell. Next one. Well, tonight you know where you're at. We're here to see Paul. We're going to wait. We're, Fran is going to introduce him. So. This is where we are. That's our reference point. Let's go to the next one. The next event is our class about uh, Revit, which is a software for engineering and architecture. Uh, so we have one Saturday here, and if needed, we can extend it. But this is something we've been planning for a while. Next one. Uh, our next big event is going to be at Irvine Global Festival, October 8th. Uh, it happens to be on Mehrigan as well. Uh, we used to have a very big event for Mehrigan, but honestly, for all practical and financial reasons, we came to join the Global Festival because they provide everything. They told us we were going to rent the, the Great Park. They said, why do you want to do that? A week before we have the same thing. So why do you want to duplicate the effort? The difference is we are there with other ethnic groups. Well, it's not all about us over there. So we <laughs> I know the Persians is all about us and you know Khariji and Dari. I know, but we got to perform. And uh, what we have, uh, we lined up uh, Ali. What's his last name? Kajush. Yeah. He is a very good uh, musician. He does oud. A traditional uh, instrument, and we have a dance group, all local girls, uh, Persian uh, dance group. So we, we only have 30 minutes to perform on the big stage. That's all we have. So this is what we're going to uh, offer. Uh, it's going to be free, free parking. The event is free. You see a lot of people. All the kids will love it because you're not putting them to go to a you know, Persian event. This is an international event, right? All their friends are going to be there. So and we are looking for volunteers too. Mr. Shire will take care of the volunteers. So th this is something good. Honestly, try to support it because uh, it's for you guys. You know, we don't make any money out of it. We have to put some money in there. Not a whole lot, but uh, it's a community service. The next one uh, is going to be, we're going to have movie nights. We try to do the third or uh, fourth uh, Saturday nights of the month. Uh, these are movies that are a little bit 
thought-provoking, not just the middle of the run, in the run of the mill. It's just a movie, and we have a coordinator that picks the movie and then talk about it, ask us questions, you know, discussion. So it's it's a semi-educational, I would say. You know, it's, you every one of these movies, I thought about it for one or two weeks afterwards. That's the effect it has on you. All right, uh, we had some preliminary discussion with Dr. Farrelly. Most of you know her. She's a psychologist, very famous after uh, Dr. Holokri. And uh, she promised to be there. She's out of the country right now, or she was planning to leave. And she said she's going to be back for November. So hopefully we'll have her over here in November. Uh, then go another one. Uh, I am hoping to have a Yalga party this year over here and uh, it's close to Christmas so it should be interesting it's our way of celebrating uh, so that's what we have planned our next big event is going to be the economic forecast we will be at uh, Hilton in Irvine and January 12th is already booked uh, this is usually one of our bigger events and totally focused on business groups and companies. Practically, I don't want to say everybody, everyone, but most Iranians do attend and a lot of other nationalities do attend because Chapman University comes with their forecast and it's a very good place to meet one another. Then uh, we're going to have one other mixer that uh, hopefully will be for engineers in February. And uh, after that, we're going to go to Norus. Hopefully, we're going to have a party. To, details to be announced later. We are planning to do it at the Irvine Hilton. That's our plan. And uh, I'm going to end this slide with Siza Vedar that most of you go to Mason Park. It is basically we do. It's our event, technically. Nobody knows it, but we do all the paperwork all these years. All right. Uh, at this time, I want uh, everybody to go around. Where is that microphone here? So introduce yourself, uh, 30 seconds, what you do, and uh, just your name and what you do. And uh, we'll yeah, we're going to introduce you later. Come on, come on, come on just tell your name. Just, uh, English, English will do it. Before I start, please take it very close to your lips. Thank you so much. So, my name is Manam. I am mechanical designer. Very good, very good. My name is Parzane and I teach uh, at Godomas College. My name is Mirniosh and I'm a client service associate for First Republic Bank. Thank you. My name is Shahba. I'm working with UCI. My name is Miriam. I'm architect and construction project engineer. <coughs> um, my name is Shadi. I'm a hairstylist. Very good. Very good. My name is Gila, and I'm a storyteller. Oh, storyteller. Storyteller. Thank you so much. Bro. My name is <coughs> my name is Turash Hakimi. And I'm a retired consultant. I'm doing right now Medicare. Thank you. Great, thank you. CMAC Jufridi, geotechnical engineer. Thank you. Saira, physician, back in New York. Thank you. I'm Kuran Ahmed Ahmadi, and I have art and archaeology. And, uh, now I'm running Iranian culture. For many years, I have to add, for many years. She's been a constant there. Uh, I'm Mona. I'm a board of director of Iranian American Chamber of Commerce, but I'm in a sales in a security system. That's my pay job. The other one is volunteer job. <laughs> I'm Moshka. I'm doing marketing development. I'm Atusa, and I'm an architect. Licensed architect, recently licensed architect. My name is Mariam and I'm a marriage and family therapist. Oh, that's yes. 
My name is Nasreen and I teach Farsi. Eli, management consultant. Ella here has been a board member and volunteer for many years. Mahit Nixon, IT. Mahit has been volunteer. Mahit Kashani, I do IT management. Firuz Hamdani, retired transportation planner. Khosro Nu Mohammadi, Mohandas. Uh, you should be a civil engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, whatever you do. All engineers. All engineers. An engineer of the year. I don't know. I have two hands. I have only one license of civil engineering. But he has one hand and so many hats. <laughs> and so smart. Thank you. We are proud of you as Iranian. I do everything simply. Single-handedly. <laughs> My name is Sheila and I'm a real estate broker. Thank you so much. Tony is Farad. Farad Arvin, digital marketer. Farad has been a big volunteer. Farad Khati Blue, uh, board of director and president of NEPA. And I'm collecting business cards. We have raffles. If you have it, it's good to put it. <coughs> Thank you so much. My name is Alazu. I teach uh, Farsi and dance and jewelry making. Persians do more than one thing. Majid Azatosh, I have a construction. Some people. Majid is our major sponsor. Majid is a former president of Nepal. We are a major sponsor. And sponsored. Thank you. I'm um, I'm an executive director of medical affairs. Uh, this is my first time coming here. Also, aspire entrepreneur. So we'll see. Thank you so much. I just came today because Bahar asked me what's going on here. I'll see what can I do. Thank you. What kind of work? I used to have. Uh, I am retired actually, but I have studied economics and I have been in this field in Iran for almost years. I'm Nessie, uh, science and I'm Tiba, retired engineer. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Last and the best. Not the last, the younger <laughs> crowd. Hi, I'm Satara and I'm currently a student. Uh, she is a volunteer and we're proud to have her here because she does everything for us. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nadine and I'm also a therapist. <laughs> Thank you for all. We have many therapists. We have to get together. You know, to our, oh, I'm so excited that all these therapists are here. But anyway, I'm Nadine, I'm therapist, I'm the secretary of NIPA. Thank you, Nadine. <laughs> Dusjan, I'm a musician, flutist, performer, and recording artist. And then some. I'm Reza Shakuri, mechanical engineer. I'm Shahriyar Etamad. I'm the board, uh, board of uh, public, I mean, board of uh, NIPAC, and I'm very pleased to have you all. I'm a licensed engineer, licensed contractor, but I practice real estate now. That's the money is. <laughs> Uh, last, uh, you know, I didn't introduce myself, so I'm Babak Fatih Lou, uh, Nepal volunteer, but as a profession, I'm a mechanical engineer, PE mechanical. We do mechanical engineering for buildings, mostly residential and mostly family. Uh, oh, action. Sorry. Yes, dear. Uh, Mr. Deust hasn't introduced me. I, he I did, introduced. he did. Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. He's a sound he system guy. Yeah, he did. Uh, it was about a month, maybe a month and a half ago, two people, one Ira Chakimi and one uh, Deuce, uh, recommended uh, to have uh, Mr. Tiger as a speaker. They are both very valued friends, and uh, so we talked to 
friend and we asked to her to organize and have him to come tonight. I would like Fran to come over here because they work very close with each other. I think that introduction will be better than mine reading from a piece of paper. <laughs> It's a dangerous thing to give microphone to a to an educator. Who may look at all but this Yes. Um, so uh, my name is Fran Faraz. I actually Parzane Faraz, and uh, I teach at Golden West College. Um, and I have the pleasure of not knowing Dr. Paul Karim Tayar, uh, who is uh, one of our English professor and also um, is novelist. A poet, you know, it's just such an honor for our college to have him. We just don't know how, how he, we wind up being so lucky, but that's what we have. Um, so, um, actually, uh, many, many years ago, one student that I knew very well, she came to me and she was like, I think you need to meet this young, very energetic, absolutely amazing professor that we have just hired. I'm like, okay, sure. So... He introduced, she introduced us to, uh, together, and then we decided to go for uh, coffee or cake or whatever, and uh, we just hit it off right away. You know, we could, we talked about many, many things, and uh, at that point, I had no idea he was Persian, or half Persian. So we were talking, and then uh, kind of like really hitting it, and, and we talked about a course that we may kind of like, you know, design together, and he knew all about, like, poor Persian poets. Oh yeah, we're going to put some some poet from from Hafez, and we're going to do that from Kalyan. And I'm like, oh wow, you know, this guy knows everything. And so the bill came, and he insisted that he will pay it. At that point, I turned around and was like, dude, are you Persian? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, my father is Shirazi. I'm like, oh my god, my grandmother is from Shiraz. And so at that point, I knew that it would be a very very long friendship. And then I started reading the books, like every so many years, you know, or every year or so, you know, the books will come out. And then I saw it also the different side and all the uh, great things um, that I didn't know uh, as I was reading it, you know, um, I got really inspired. So I have to say, you, you got to read the books for yourself, and then we will also hear from Dr. Tayar tonight. Um, it's a very unique style that I don't think we have seen that style before. Like, um, and I thought definitely the Persian community should know him. Um, and um, well known in uh, other communities, but you know, definitely the Persian community, especially the young generation, should know him. So uh, without any further ado, I'll introduce you to Dr. Paul Kerry Tayar. Thank you all for having me, and thank you, Fran, for that great introduction. It's funny, Fran says that we've had a 20-year friendship now, but Fran really has become the, the sister I never had. I mean, it really is true that I mean, she really has become family. Um, I also just wanted to say, this is such an amazing event and organization. I, um, my father came out um, from Shiraz in the early 70s, and he wound up going back. Um, in the early 2000s. So he's, he's living again in Shiraz and has been there for the last 21 years. And, you know, he never really fit here. You know, and, and he and I have spoken a lot about that over the years, that he felt very disconnected here and isolated. And um, I'm really struck by um, how, how much an organization like this really would have meant a lot to him. So this is such a beautiful thing that, that you all have put together and sustained. Um, thank you. Is that better? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is just really a, a, a wonderful gathering. This is, I, as I was even just hearing all of you guys introduce yourselves, how much something like this would have meant to someone like him. Um, I also, the one other thing I do want to say that was funny is hearing everyone introduce themselves. I remember speaking to my dad on the phone maybe six or seven years ago, and I'd asked him why when he came here, and, and he, he, had, he had initially settled in San Francisco to start university there, and I'd asked him, how did you decide um, to pursue engineering? And he was like, 
I'm Persian. <laughs> like he was just completely <laughs> confused by the question, as if there was going to be any other, you know, option for him to pursue. So uh, this is very much making me feel um, quite at home, I have to say. So so thank you for inviting me and, and including me in this tonight. Um, so you know, I thought uh, in regards to most of what I read tonight would actually revolve around ideas of um, immigration or or you know. Uh, trying to kind of root oneself um, uh, in in the United States, but also not kind of sacrifice what has meant a lot to someone from their country of origin or birth. Um, you know, I, I think one of the reasons it's played such a meaningful part of my work is not just kind of um, seeing and, and kind of, you know, living through in some respects my father's experiences, but also the kind of interesting disconnection I, I felt in, in the sense that, um, you know, my dad was the only one who came out here. Um, you know, I've never met any of my uh, aunts or uncles or cousins or anybody. Um, his mother came out for one summer when I was about eight years old, and that was you know, a wonderful summer. I've never eaten so well in my entire life. Um, <laughs> but, um, but other than that, you know, my, my kind of central connection in a lot of respects to, to Iranian culture was through the, the poetry and literature and films that my dad introduced me to. And so I think one of the reasons that it consistently f has found its way into my work is a way to kind of keep that side of myself and maybe that side of my heritage alive and, and, and they, uh, you know, helping, helping enable me in some respects to still feel connected to that. Um, and secondly, when, when we uh, relocated uh, to Orange County in the late 70s, the, uh, the the area we moved into, the, the apartment complex we moved into, was was kind of like a, a, a very um, lower working class United Nations. You know, there was people from all over the world. And, you know, it, it was really the place in, in the city I grew up in where if you had just fled a country, um, uh, that was where you initially settled in. And so I've noticed, too, in my work over the years that a lot of the characters and poems that I wind up writing um, are in some respects trying to call the memories of those people that I was surrounded by growing up um, back to life in a meaningful way. Um, so I thought I would actually start with uh, a few poems from a, a book of mine that came out a few years ago called Immigrant Songs, which kind of revolves around these ideas of immigration, migration, resettlement. Um, and I thought I would start actually with a, a, a poem that's inspired by, I five or six years ago I was on a flight um, uh, from Los Angeles to Boston and it was a really just kind of a nightmarish flight. <laughs> the point where the weather was so bad at one point that the pilot came over the loudspeaker and he's like, yeah, we should be landing about an hour if we make it. <laughs> Pause, you know, I mean, he, he didn't have a very good bed, bedside manner in a sense. So the first thing I did getting off the airplane was there was a, there was a non-denominational chapel called Our Lady of the Airways right in the airport. I just went right for that. And this is a, a poem that, kind, that, that uh, was inspired by that particular experience. So this is called Our Lady of the Airways Chapel, Logan Airport, Boston. The chapel is empty when I arrive, except for one Muslim woman kneeling on a prayer rug performing salah, her purple scarf wrapped loosely around her hair. I sit in one of the back pews and say the Our Father before reading the first few pages of a book by Robert Lowell, the unofficial patron saint of the city I am visiting for the very first time. I've only just landed and already I feel like I'm flying again as prayer and poetry cast their dual spells. And I find that the room has become a sky that has never known rain. And the woman and I comprise a small constellation that shines out over the sea. So this second poem is actually inspired by a friend um, of, of my father's that I remember would come around a lot when I was a kid. And he had, he, he had come, uh, uh, he had left around a little later in the, in the wake of the revolution. And I remember hearing him tell this story to my father as to explaining as to why he had left. What was the last thing that happened that really inspired a kind of realization in him that he was going to have to leave. So this is a poem that's kind of inspired by that story. It's called The Winter's Night in Tehran, 1979. On the night they burned the movie theater, you thought of the time you and Hamid had gone there to see a late showing of Bonnie and Clyde. When at the film's conclusion, the audience had stood up and applauded for several minutes before leaving the building. 
Afterwards, the two of you had gone to a cafe and talked about Faye Dunaway's beauty, Warren Beatty's charisma, and how the two of them were the American counterculture's answer to Layla and Majnoon. Yet another pair of lovers who wrongly believed they controlled their own destiny. With your windows open and the scent of smoke entering your room and your decision to leave for America having been made, you realized you suddenly understood what Clyde Barrow had meant when he said that he and Bonnie weren't running towards something, but away from something else. So, you know, something that um, I, I don't think I mentioned yet, I've, I've never had the opportunity to visit Iran, and so so much of it exists entirely in, in my imagination or in the photos my dad sends or in the stories that my grandmother had told me when she was out here. Um, so this is, a, this is a poem that was kind of inspired by the possibility of someday visiting. It's called Portrait of Shiraz in Another 100 Years. I imagine myself as a date farmer and my father an old man, a painter, drawing his brush upon the large walls of his home, upon the walls and the streets of his childhood, painting verses from Rumi, from Hafez, from the Quran, from the epic of the kings, painting the faces of courtesans traveling through the desert, their colored scarves like the flags of as yet unsettled countries, their colored scarves like the wings of wild birds floating through the air, their colored scarves like cypress trees swaying in the wind, painting the names of those whose graves are still unmarked, the names of those whose sons and daughters make shrines of the small gardens in their yard, so that those spirits will have somewhere to come at nights when it is time to sleep. My father's sisters are two dancers in the empty, empty amphitheater of Persepolis, the moon like a wood, but the hands of seven angels are playing together. So um, this is a, a poem that was actually inspired by, so my, my parents met in college uh, at the University of San Francisco. Um, in the early 70s. My mother is an Irish Catholic woman from Los Angeles, so they certainly make quite the pair. Um, <laughs> especially my, my mom always tells the stories about, you know, she was very much a part of kind of the hippie counterculture of the early 70s. And so, you know, my dad has always spoken about how, you know, leaving Iran and landing first in Haight-Ashbury, San Francisco, and seeing my mother... <laughs> It's like seeing somebody from another planet, you know, so um, San Francisco kind of retains a really special place in my heart for that reason, and so this is a, a poem inspired by the city. It's called Golden Gate Blues in a -Line. I rode a streetcar through the rain. San Francisco waved its winter wand across the almost sleeping bay, and the poem of my lover's ghost sat beside me on that lonely train. I felt like a character in a long lost book by Twain. Someone with no checks to cash and a thousand debts to pay. I rode a streetcar through the rain. The fishermen along the wharf remained. They listened to what the dark water had to say. And the poem of my lover's ghost sat beside me on that rolling train. In my head, Bob Dylan sang about a woman he once lost in Spain, or maybe not. Maybe it was a different song he played. I can't say. I rode a streetcar through the rain. Who knew what the nights ahead contained? I simply buttoned up my coat and watched the birds on telegraph all fly away. And the poem of my lover's ghost sat beside me on that rolling train. I had already stayed too long in that city. Still, I knew I would remain. The bridge was like a god to whom a penitent might pray. I rode a streetcar through the rain. And the poem of my lover's ghost sat beside me on that rolling train. So I, <laughs> it never entirely took hold, but growing up, um, you know, my, my father certainly did his best to uh, turn me into a soccer fanatic. Um, I wound up being more of a, a basketball guy, but I do have so many good memories of being a kid. Um, uh, playing soccer with him across the street. Um, and this is a, a poem inspired by that. It's called Soccer at Night. Every time he kicked the ball, I was surprised that it ever came down. Each one a moonshot, a black and white rainbow. 
a wild bird dizzy with joy over what its body was capable of. After each kick, he would watch the balls arc the way an astronomer might look at the stars, Galileo searching for new constellations to name, Copernicus silent with wonder at the new truths the sky had revealed. This is called Different Weathers. It was after you had climbed the staircase of the clouds and run your hand along the hair of the rain, your fingertips shining as if they had wept, that the sun opened its palm to reveal its poem. Your heart beat as rapidly as the tide of the wind that would later carry you back to earth, and to the soil beneath which you buried the poem the light had provided for you. It does not matter that you cannot remember what the poem said, nor does it matter that you cannot remember where you buried it. Treasure maps, after all, are meant for those who come after you. So I thought I would read one of the, um, the stories from, from my most recent book, which is a, a collection of short stories called The Revolution of Heavenly Bodies and Other Stories. Um, the collection really is, it, it's, it, it's a set of stories all set in the, in the 1980s, mostly in Los Angeles and San Francisco. And it, it involves or concerns people from all over the world who find their way here. Um, usually as a result of having had to have uh, fled the, the country of their birth. And the, the story I'm going to read is called Through the Window, and it, 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 it's inspired by you know, so many of the, um, the, the Middle Eastern men I grew up surrounded by who, um, kind of like my father, never quite seemed to find their footing uh, in the United States, you know, quite maybe the way they had hoped. And that, you know, I remember being in some of their houses or hearing some of them talk sometimes and how there was always a kind of sense of longing or yearning that they were, they were partly here and partly still somewhere else emotionally. Um, and, you know, like I said, I mean, my, my own father was certainly like that in a lot of respects. And so um, this story kind of is, is, is born out of, of those memories and experiences. So it's called Through the Window. Through the window, he can see the three girls turning pirouettes in air and garden. One of them wears a red backpack. Another wears red shoes. He thinks of the film he saw as a child at the local cinema, the one where a tornado has blown the heroine thousands of miles away from her home. He thinks of the dog and the road full of yellow bricks. He thinks of the flying monkeys that frightened him for months afterwards. Through the window, he can see his mother kneeling at his bedside, telling him there is no such thing. Still, he asks her to leave the light on and to make sure the window is latched. He asks about tornadoes and if the weather in Shiraz is anything like Kansas. His mother tosses his hair. She tells him maybe one day he will see Kansas for himself. I'll need some red shoes, he tells his mother. You will indeed, she answers. Through the window, he can see the cinema burning. He can see an old man on the street telling anyone who will listen that it was Allah's will. He can see his father taking his hand and leading him away from the fire. Through the window, he sees himself holding up a sliver of charred film stock that he has picked up from the street. He sees the silhouettes of a man and a woman kissing. Through the window, he can see the dome of the Latfala Mosque. He can see his father kneeling in prayer. He can see himself kneeling beside him. He can see the carpets that the two of them are kneeling on. He can see himself as he was then, a young boy who still believes that at any moment one of these carpets might fly away. Through the window he can see his grandfather answering the door just as the family has sat down for dinner. He can see his grandfather returning to the dining room and saying he needs to step out for a few minutes. He can see his parents watching with concern as his grandfather exits the house flanked by a trio of men in dark clothes. Through the window, he can see the nude body of Alaha, his first love. He can see the two of them, still a year away from graduating high school, lying on the bed of a house a few blocks from Azadi Park. The house, which belongs to a friend of his older brother's, has no furniture in it other than a bed and one large bookshelf. His brother has told him before giving him the key to keep the curtains drawn and to only enter from the alley. He has told him not to use the lights. 
He has told him that if the phone rings twice and then stops, that means the two of them need to leave at once. He can see himself moving his lips to her neck and then to her breasts. He can see Elahe afterwards, her head upon his chest, telling him that tomorrow she will leave this country. He can see her lifting her head from his chest and looking him in the eyes and saying that he should do the same. What he cannot see is what is actually here. It is two o'clock in the afternoon. It is the middle of summer. He is sitting in the dining room of his Victorian house in the Haight-Ashbury section of San Francisco. There are three parked cars across the street. The postman is placing parcels into the red mailbox of one of his neighbors. He cannot see these things because he is too busy seeing so much else through his window of a house located in the country that he arrived in 38 years ago. His parents did not come with him. Neither did his brother, who joined the newly formed National Army instead. His younger sister, two months prior to him leaving, fled to Istanbul, where she married a painter and with whom she had three children, the youngest of whom died when the bomb someone had planted in the department store where he was working detonated precisely 27 minutes into his shift. So the window, this window. Through it, he can see his sister at the funeral, which has been held in Pengalti Cemetery because her husband is Christian. He can see his sister place three white flowers upon her son's coffin before it is lowered into the ground. He can see himself reciting a favorite poem of their grandfather's after the priest has blessed his nephew's memory. He can see the sculpture of an angel that stands less than a hundred feet from where his nephew is being buried, her wings outstretched against the sky. When he turns back to the window, he can see San Francisco as it was when he first arrived, the cable car that he liked to ride all the way to North Beach, the bookstore near Fisherman's Wharf whose second floor loft featured authors who had been banned in their home countries, the drum circles in Golden Gate Park frequented by young men who believed in the divine spirit but not in wearing shirts, who believed in the language of the body, but not in the language of power, who believed the earth was their mother, but that no government was their father. Through the window he can see his wife, which amazes him, given that he knows she is in the next room as I write this, sitting on a sofa and reading a book by Borges. His wife, who has always insisted that he sing songs in his sleep that are lovelier than anything she has ever heard on the radio, his wife, who has always wondered where it is he goes when it is clear that he is no longer present. Anyway, through this window he sees his wife, though she is not yet his wife on this particular night. She is wearing blue jeans and a white blouse, and she is standing beneath a doorway in Telegraph Hill and waiting for the rain to stop. He opens his umbrella for her and asks which way she is headed. By the time they reach the BART station, they have agreed to meet the following evening for dinner at an Italian place near the university she is attending. Through the window, he can see the face of the Ayatollah looking out in a large crowd in Argentan Square. Through the window, he can see the face of his grandfather refusing to answer questions. Through the window, he can see the face of his older brother dying on the second day of battle on the outskirts of Shalom Sheh. Through the window, he can see a gas station in the Tenderloin owned by a cousin of his who arrived in America only a few months after him. The cousin leans against the hood of an automobile he is in the process of fixing a blue Mercedes with chrome hubcaps, the cousin who in 1994 will leave America for Toronto, the cousin who in 1999 will sit in the car with the garage door closed and then turn the ignition. Through the window he can see his own daughter on her 15th birthday. He can see her blowing out the candles on the cake which her mother and two of her mother's friends have baked for her. Through the window he can see that he is dreaming. He can see this because there is no way he can be seeing all of these things at once. Certainly not. Yet the dream continues. The window remains open. But through it he can see himself, earlier this year, sitting beside a man much older than him on the bus. The man is reading a magazine whose cover features the title The New Middle East, beneath which is a photograph of an American soldier in combat fatigues and holding a high-powered rifle. Above the man is a sky so blue it seems as if it might have been painted by Van Gogh or Monet. The old man, several minutes later, closes the magazine, looks at him, and shakes his head from side to side. Through the window, he sees himself as he sits at this very moment, a 57-year-old man with more gray in his beard than black, in a dark blue dress shirt and khaki pants, a bald man with brown eyes the color of the olives his mother used to grow in the garden of his childhood home, the garden where he used to sit 
and see his father sitting beside the dining room window, looking out in the garden, looking at him. Thank you. So the next two poems I'm going to read are actually um, inspired by I. I teach a, a mythology class, um, usually once every year or once every other year, and one of my favorite collections to teach is The Thousand and One Nights, which I just have been enchanted by since I was a little kid. <clears throat> Especially the, the theme of kind of reinvention or of the, the impossible seeming every day or almost mundane and uh, expected in a sense. And both of these poems are, are kind of born out of um, having grown up hearing those stories all the time and now teaching them as an adult myself. So the first is called Personal History. This was in the year when a ship took leave of the water and floated out across the clouds. When the clouds became the open palms of the angels. The year when the angels strung their wings across the telephone lines like laundry drying in the sun. Only there was no sun. Not that year. That came later. When the children turned first into horses and then into ghosts. When the rain fell in love with the poet, when the poet forgot his own name and then the names for everything else. That was a good year, a year without names, a year when I learned to kneel without my knees ever touching the ground and where the gods all prayed to us. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I should start at the beginning. Um, and so this is the, the companion piece to that. Um, one of the things that I, I, I find myself having to do with students a lot whenever I'm teaching uh, the, the, the Thousand One Nights is to get them to think symbolically. And so one of the things that I'll typically have them do before we begin reading is to keep a dream journal for a few nights and record their dreams because that really is the language that that particular text is working in. So this is called Dream Journal. If you're swimming then you have lost something important. <clears throat> if you're flying, then your heart's been broken. If you sit at a table before a deck of cards and you are afraid of getting older. If you undress beneath a single spotlight, then you are about to commit a crime. If you were singing while holding a Spanish guitar, then someone you know has passed away. If you are preparing to leap from a balcony, then you are mourning the loss of your childhood. If you place your lips to the breast of a cloud, then you have forgotten to say your prayers. If you run three red lights in a row, then there is a lesson you still haven't learned. If you pull water from an old well, then your father is preparing to call you long distance. If you hear music playing from another house on your street, then your sister is about to come back from the dead. If you cup your hands as the hard rain begins, then you are days away from falling in love. If you find that you cannot run when you want to, then there is a book that you need to reread. If you awaken in a field of strawberries, then a long journey awaits you. If you eat the strawberries, then you won't be going alone. So, um, let me just check and see. Okay, so I'll read just a, two or three more poems. Um, so, and Fran and I have spoken about this some over the years, that... Um, my, my dad's central relationship to America before he, he arrived in the country was his absolute love of Western movies. That, you know, he was a huge, you know, Clint Eastwood, John Wayne. He knew all those films, The Searchers and The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, and so on. And he never seemed to really have much of a grasp for maybe what was or was not suitable to show a kid, a little kid. So uh, there were no <laughs> cartoons or anything being shown in my house that I was watching John Wayne movies and Clint Eastwood movies when I was four or five. Um, much to my mother's eternal frustration. Um, but I loved them. I just ate them up. We would watch them on these long marathons on TV every weekend when I was a kid. And so this is a poem kind of inspired by some of those memories. It's called On Horses. As a boy, I wanted to be Robert Redford and Jeremiah Johnson, Paul Newman and Ombre, Burt Reynolds and Ossie Davis and Sam Whiskey, Montgomery Clift and Red River. Just a man on a horse moving through open country with nothing but the sun to guide his way. Only I didn't want to carry a gun. 
I didn't want to fight the Indians either. Instead, I just wanted to go on riding day after day, year after year. My horse galloping at top speeds across an America I hoped would never be settled. Breakfast at sunrise. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Breakfast at sunrise. Dinner at sunset. And in between the brim of my hat shielding me from the heat and the rain. Genesis tells us that on the first day God created heaven and earth. Light and dark. Evening and morning. But I don't think this is true. Any boy raised on John Ford films knows that in the beginning there were horses and prairies and women standing on wooden porches waiting for men in for supper. Some of those horses had names, while others disappeared back into the mountains every time a man got too close with a saddle. I imagine the same will be true on the last day of all the days of life on this planet. Darkness and light will both vanish back into the beauty from whence they came, and a team of brown horses will remain in a field full of green grass and wildflowers, waiting for all things to be born again. Um, it's funny, actually, that, that song was my very first ringtone when I first had <laughs> got a cell phone. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just I'll close with, with this one. Um, I can pull it up here. So I mentioned that my, my grandmother on my father's side came out for one summer. I was about eight years old. And... Um, I still remember when we picked her up at the airport. I, I don't think I've ever been hugged like that for the rest of my life. Just like the intensity of it, just how, I mean, like how much it meant to both to me and to her clearly. Um, I think largely because, you know, though I was not aware of it being that young, I mean, I think she knew that this was going to be, you know, the only summer we had together, which, which it certainly wound up that being the case. Um, and I couldn't speak Farsi and she couldn't speak English. Um, and yet we spent just about every moment of every day go to that entire summer. Um, and <laughs> very quickly I learned that her, it, it, you know, we talk now about love languages. Her love language was certainly food, you know, cooking. So, I mean, I, I've never eaten better than I ate that summer with her. So um, this, is a, this is a poem about that summer in, and, and her, the, the way she took care of me that summer. It's called A Summer of Last Suppers. When I would come home from school, she would look at me and ask in Farsi, a language I had not learned to speak, what I wanted for lunch. For an answer, I would just smile and nod my head. Yes, I would say. Yes. And then I would go and sit on the sofa and watch television while she cooked. Fifteen minutes, sometimes a half an hour later, she would emerge from the kitchen with a plate. If she had made me a hamburger, it was the largest hamburger the world had ever seen. The meat patty the size of the plate itself and sliced into two halves, each of them needing two slices of bread to cover the meat. On the days when she made fish, it was a salmon the size of a dolphin, its eyes wide open, as if it too couldn't believe that she thought I could eat the entire thing. French fries? They'd be as thick as your thumbs and there'd be 80 or 100 of them, piled so high that they looked like their own unhealthy food pyramid. For snacks, she'd bring an entire watermelon to the table, slice it open, and hand me a fork. The same with a cantaloupe. At the time, I thought she was worried that I was too skinny, or that the head nod in Iranian culture meant give me the largest of everything. But now I realize she wasn't feeding me for the day, but for the rest of my life that those two months of meals were going to have to last me forever, and that she wanted the taste of those burgers and those magical outsized watermelons and cantaloupes to stay with me long after she had gone back to Shiraz, long after her temporary travel visa had expired, long after she had become too old to board a plane and fly halfway across the world to see us, because a full belly, after all, means love in any language. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Uh, yep. We have someone holding. Thank you for the fresh air.
And you're left. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Question for you. In the Persian culture, Persian poetry, it is paramount to rhyme advertising. Yeah. If you don't rhyme it, it's not poetry. How did U.S. poetry has no rhyme and yet call it poetry? And then on the I was raised in the South, and then I also went to black college, where the rap and the country western mimics Persian. Poetry. Yes, very much so. Why so. does it work? It's a really good question. Well, I think. You know, uh, partly I had kind of an interesting mix as well that, first off, you know, I was, I was exposed obviously to a lot of Persian poetry growing up, but it was my father reciting it to me in English. And so um, it took on a, a much kind of uh, more kind of narrative-based feel that wasn't predicated as much on rhyme. Um, secondly, at the same time I was, I was growing up reading those poems in translation, um, I was also reading a lot of American poetry, which is deeply free verse. You know, Walt Whitman or, or, or writers like that. And I, so I think there was kind of a natural merging there. Um, what I instead attempted to do as I got a little older and began writing, rhyming myself was rather than relying on rhyme, but to instead rely on rhythm. And so I try to kind of have, hopefully, ideally, the lines to have some kind of interior rhythm or feel where it becomes more spell-like or almost chant-like, where rather than the, the structure re relying on end rhyme, it relies instead on a kind of consistent pattern, in a sense. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm successful in that, but that's certainly the hope. Um, the other thing you mentioned, too, um, about the country music, I, you know, I, I, I grew up loving country music, and one of the things that I, I noticed kind of found its way into my poetry was a lot of the, the imagery was... Middle Eastern, or, or certainly was coming out of the, the, the stories I would hear from my dad, but um, the emphasis on like everyday experience was very much coming out of like Waylon Jennings songs or Johnny Cash songs or something, because that was stuff I was hearing uh, around me constantly. Um, and so I think it just wound up, wound up being kind of an interesting hybrid of influences. You know, especially I think, I don't know if there are any other only children in here, but when you're an only child and your parents work full time, you're alone a lot to just like consume everything. So I was, I was listening to all different kinds of stuff or watching all different kinds of stuff and I think it all kind of found its way into, into the work. Yeah. How did Rumi take so much good place in, in the press? Where for those he said, you know what he knows. I know Matt Kayyam, only you see him on the timeline of, of the mathematics of tradition. Yeah. How did Rumi come up so well? So that's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert. My, my guess, I notice this when I teach Rumi in my classes, is there's something about him that feels very contemporary. You know, that he, he talks so much about romantic love and festivals and community and drinking wine and he, he talks about depression or frustration. I mean, these are all things that still speak to people even in 2022. Um, and they don't necessarily require a, a, a really deeply rooted understanding of like Persian history. You know, I, I have taught the, the Epic of the Kings, for instance, in, in a myth class, and you know, you have to do a lot of lecturing to find to kind of contextualize a work like that for students. So they appreciate it, but it's not as accessible. You know, and so I think that's one of the key things with someone like Rumi. I think the other thing is too, um, you know, his his works are very especially. In, in, the, in the best translations we see. Um, you know, I know uh, you had worked on, on some of these, a really wonderful book of those, um, that um, they're very conversational. You know, and so, like, I've noticed a lot of students will even respond to that, where they'll say it actually just sounds like on the reading room, like somebody just sitting next to them at a party or at a bar telling them a story. You know, now, again, that's just my hunch, you know, but, but I've noticed a similar thing, that He's somebody that whenever I introduce him to any kind of level of students, they almost always immediately gravitate to. I think also, too, he's very funny a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And so that, that also gives it a very low uh, barrier to entry, you know, that students, even if they're 18 or 19 and have only known life in Southern California, they can kind of respond to that. Well, we have new people uh, joined us. Great, wonderful. Introduce them. Uh, hello, uh, this is... Kamiya, uh, one of our uh, colleagues for here, and uh, one of the uh, board of directors for Nikpai. I'm as a uh, iconic for here. Uh, that's it. I'm 
I'm so enjoyed. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Farah Zaman. I have a master's degree in um, marketing. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I have my son, <laughs> who is my trainer. And I told him, since you were born here, you better be here. Because <laughs> you're going to enjoy this one. Here. Hi, I'm Sasan. I loved your last two stories, the oh, one right. with your grandma and uh, oh, thank you. Oh, that was the one that stuck with me the most. The, yeah, I love the food. Uh, <laughs> the food of uh, Langley Earth. Love Langley it, it really <laughs> is. It is very true. Yeah, and we feed him a lot. <laughs> this really. event has been very different for Nipah. I think um, our engineers and architects have been in our uh, different events that it was more technical and I hope everybody enjoyed and please continue uh, use this platform to introduce yourself and enjoy but I I'm going to do something different than we haven't done before I want to go around and find out who else has that secret and passion of poetry and they have secretly sitting in a corner and write about their emotion. You can just raise your hand and let me know if anyone here want to share their secret. It's not secret anymore. <laughs> well, it's not poetry. It's creative writing and creative storytelling. And uh, my passion comes from my childhood, like what Paul was saying. All I remember, I was a little kid, and all I would see is like images. And so that passion has lived within me, and uh, I feel very fortunate that I can take the old stories and give them new meanings and new characters. So the passion, I think, is with the child. As far as when we're children, and we get it from our parents, like Bob said. So that's where my passion comes from. So you are a poet? I do storytelling. Storytelling. I do um, painting, paint, glass yes. work. But basically, basically everything is like a concept. Like right now I'm working on animals and why they influence human beings. So it comes to me as I go through life. That's good. Okay. It's meditating. Is uh, anyone else? Yes. Well, you should have told me to bring my poetry book. Uh, it's not published, but I could have read it from it. You can memorize anyway. it, right? What's that? Are you memorizing it? Uh, well, no, it? not my own, but I have others that I have memorized. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're all in Farsi, so... Yeah, but you should have told us. I would have bring my book. <laughs> As I said, it's something spontaneous. So anyone else has that passion? Yes. And if anyone remember their own poem, that would be good to share. There you go. I can tell you, I cannot put three words together and call it a poem. <laughs> However, especially for Dr. Tayyar, there are hundreds and hundreds of music on YouTube, from the old music, from the begins, from Marab the Boost, etc. And I play keyboard, and one of the things that I do, I take them and I modify them and rearrange them. You will not believe it just brings you life. And everybody has forgotten about it. The YouTube is there. Go back to it. Whether it's Gold Power or whoever, I did it. Those are wonderful music and wonderful poetry. <laughs> It just is dissipating. And by the way, none of our youngsters are picking it up, unfortunately. Thank you. Actually, I think the Rumi has been a big fan of sharing the poems and dance and Sama and Sarah and Ibrahim. Um, Moulana and Moulavi is not the right name. So, we want to do that. So, I actually have a question for Paul. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am 
as I said earlier, so many of you don't know me, none of you know me actually, um, but I am half Persian, I'm half Hungarian, so it's really cool to see how Paul has illustrated kind of these memories of growing up in such a diverse setting. Um, now, how was it growing up? Because for me, I was very immersed into the Persian culture, um, where I was very proud. I was dancing all the time. I was singing all the time. I learned Farsi just by picking up things and also taking a Plum and Fire Sundays class at <laughs> Holmes College back in 2005. <laughs> um, so how was it growing up for you in Orange County with, you know, your dad being Persian, your mom being American, and how was it, you know, kind of being in the American American culture at the same time. Thank you. Um, that's that's a really great question. It, it is so funny too how you can have such similar backgrounds mm -hmm. and have such different experiences. Because for me, I have to admit, I mean, I really associated the Iranian side of my heritage with really profound grief. Mm -hmm. That my my dominant memories of growing up in regards to that component of, of my background where like my dad trying to get family members on the phone back home when the Iran-Iraq war was going on and he lost a lot of people in, in, in his extended family as a result of that. Um, or I remember, you know, there was a, there was, I think it was on Sunday mornings for about three hours, there was a Persian news channel that we could get the feed on and I would watch it with him and I would have him, you know, he would kind of explain to me what was happening and you know, so much of it was, was was coming from a real place of sadness at the time. And um, uh, I think it was magnified by the fact that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like we were, we were very poor. And so um, that creates its own sense of isolation in a sense. You know, so certainly the my, my mother's side of the family, you know, I was much more kind of rooted in that, you know, uh, her, my aunts and uncles and grandparents on that side were all pretty close, and I spent a lot of time with them. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the few times that uh, even very distant cousins of my father would come out, I mean, it was usually as a result of some kind of tragedy that occurred. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, for instance, like not learning Farsi, I didn't know this at the time, but my, my mom had said, you know, my dad was very kind of insistent at the time, but like, he didn't want me to learn it, mm -hmm. you know, because he, he, he didn't want to you know, he felt almost in some respects that it might put me at risk even in a way. I mean, I, I have very vivid memories of like, how often, especially when I was maybe in the very early 80s, how often my dad and I would get pulled over by the police, you know, in ways that would never happen when it was when I was just with my mother. Yeah. You know, um, especially because I, I'm much fairer than him. I have a very vivid memory of he had taken me to Foster Street or something, it was a six and we were leaving, and this police officer came up to me looked at me and he was like, are you okay? So I'm kidnapped wow. or something, you know? And so, you know, certainly that come out of my heritage, I remember carrying a lot of sadness in regards to. Um, I didn't have, <coughs> was it even something like this, which is just such a, a beautiful space, like these weren't my experiences in life. And so I think it's also why it's found its way that I'm writing so much is because I can kind of imagine my way into it or now that I'm a little older, Think about it in, a, in maybe a more mature way. I, I find even now, I mean, I, I haven't seen my dad in 21 years, and yet whenever we talk on the phone, um, we have much kind of deeper conversations about Iran and its past and politics and everything than we did when I was a kid when he kind of wanted to shield me from a lot of it. You know, so I feel like in some respect I'm kind of playing catch up to some of that, for sure. Thank you. Any of you um, are interested? We have a Ella here that she make beautiful poems in Farsi, and because the way she expressed that, it's going to be Farsi. So, but your Farsi is going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's I not will ask yet. you. <laughs> yeah, my son is trying to speak Farsi more because her, his girlfriend is interested in learning Farsi. It's not going to happen. 